revista semanal britânica The Economist vai na contramão das tendências de crise na imprensa escrita internacional. Jornais perdem leitores, fecham. Revistas como a americana Newsweek estão à venda porque dão prejuízo. Enquanto outras publicações do gênero perdem leitores, a economista ganha. Vende 1 milhão e 400 mil exemplares por semana. Mais nos Estados Unidos e no resto do mundo do que no Reino Unido, onde é editada. São 4 milhões de leitores compartilhando a revista no papel e mais ainda via internet, apesar do acesso pago. Seu conteúdo não baixa o nível para ganhar público e os artigos sobre economia, política, tecnologia, cultura mantêm nível sofisticado, sem perder clareza. Leitores altamente qualificados e de bom poder aquisitivo atraem anunciantes. Para discutir a fórmula do sucesso da Economist, o Milênio foi à sede da revista, no centro de Londres, para conversar com o editor-chefe John Micklethwaite, formado em História pela Universidade de Oxford. E com mais uma edição fechada, ele nos recebeu em seu escritório com vista para o Parlamento e outras atrações da cidade. Com preço de capa e assinatura acima da média dos concorrentes, a Economist tem vários donos, o grupo Pearson Financial Times, a famílias como a Rothschild. Algum assunto proibido na Economist? Celebridade não tem vez, esclarece o editor-chefe. Okay, John, before we move on to the central question of your success, uh, please clarify to our viewers, uh, why do you call yourself a newspaper when you're a magazine? Um, I think that's, a, that's an unavoidable idiosyncrasy. <laughs> We, we've always called ourselves a newspaper. It was invented as the Economist newspaper. It is, um, out of all the strange things we do, it's perhaps the least defensible. Well, how about the other one, the fact that you, there's never a byline, we never know who's uh, writing anything? <laughs> that, that, I think, is defensible. And in that case, what we do, I think there are three reasons for that. The first is, we're not the people who are the exceptions, you are, is that everyone, if you looked at newspapers around the world, they all used to be anonymous. And then they started building and giving people bigger bylines and pictures and things. And we've always stuck to the anonymity. So that's one reason. The second reason is that we're, um, it's, I suppose it's part of our brand now. We're, we're one of the few people who do it. But the last reason is we are a kind of collegial place. We, we, we work together. So it is, it is our view rather than the view of any one journalist. Your title as well. The Economist kind of suggests a very dry magazine that only deals with boring subjects, whereas in fact you deal with politics, with economics, with art, culture. It's, it's kind of, it's just the tradition? It is. I mean, it was called The Economist, I think, and The Railway Gazette. So you could argue we've got, well, we've got I, more interesting. We improved <laughs> by removing The Railway but, Gazette. By, but, but I actually think it's a good title because actually... The reason why economics is important is firstly because economics is important by itself, nowhere more than, than now, but secondly also because economics is a fantastic prism to look at the world through. It doesn't apply to everything. You can't look at a picture or a painting through economics, but a lot of problems you can look at and reducing them down to the numbers and forcing yourself to take a statistical approach and forcing yourself to think about the incentives for people to do this or that actually is quite useful and that sort of focus on statistics, numbers, the facts, th th those can make arguments much more powerful I think. I'm sort of proud of the name in that way. You don't think it scares uh, I think it does, I think it, if you look at the, the market readers. research, if a lot of people see The Economist they think oh gosh and then so <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure our, our um, I'm sure our um, marketing department at times despairs of it, but... Would you like it to be called the Celebrity no, Weekly? <laughs> exactly, no, no I, I dream of that, but sadly not, no. <laughs> what, uh, you know, when many other uh, weeklies or magazines in general, even the, the print media and the newspapers and all that, uh, going through a crisis, you're doing well. Um, let's start with a very broad question. Mm. What do you think is the secret, the, secret you know, the formula, that explains your success? I think I can tell you why I think we're doing, we've been doing well recently. And I think there's sort of three factors in that. One is globalization. Is, uh, Brazil is a brilliant example. Is that, I don't know, 20 years ago, the idea that if you lived in Detroit, you really wanted to know what was happening in Sao Paulo or Rio. That, that was quite a hard sell. Now it's much easier. 
People need to know about what's happening. You know, Brazil is an amazingly important country to many other places in the world. We write about it, and we've always done so in a way which other people haven't. So globalization has helped us. Um, a second reason, I think, is just the mass of information has strangely made a weekly filter quite useful. The more stuff that's on the internet, the more things that people are trying to find out about, it's quite useful to have a thing which once a week looks at the news and says, look, this is the important stuff. This is the stuff you need to know about. You don't need to know about the other things. But in principle, that's what all weeklies do. Whereas the others are in trouble, you're not. So is it, a, you well, do it better? <clears throat> I think we're lucky. I think we've been lucky to the extent that we've, on the global side, I think, I'm not going to talk about individual ones, but you, a lot of the other ones, if you're, if you're a, if you're a, um, a French or German one, or a Brazilian one, or a Portuguese one, you have a language problem. If you're an American one, you have a slight problem in this extent, is that America has a, has a stick in every fight in the world. America is the superpower, and America itself is so fascinating that it sometimes means that whenever you look at things outside, there's always an American point of view that people often wrongly ascribe to you. The advantage of being British is that nobody, I mean, sometimes we get letters saying, you're taking a British attitude to this. But on the whole, it's not, we, we don't suffer from that. Whilst America, by definition, is involved in every political decision pretty much around the world, whilst Britain... So they're kind Sadly, of the elephant in the room. So when people read their magazines, they say, well, I'm reading an American there, magazine. There isn't that, you, you get that back. Um, I th actually, to be honest, I think it's unfair. I think the, the American news magazines do a good job in that. But it's a, but it's a, but it's that perception, I think, I've been told repeatedly seems to help us. When you have your editorial meetings, you know, you need to decide what to put in a newspaper. Is there, I mean, you cover all kinds of topics, but is there a subject or are there areas where you say, this is not for us. Oh, <laughs> celebrity, I suppose. I, even then, you know, we would, we sometimes poke fun at it. We did a obituary of somebody called Jade Goody, who was a, um, a sort of t weird TV star here. You know, we'll occasionally poke our nose into that, but we're not going to end up putting, I live in hope of us putting Cameron Diaz on the cover, but there isn't, there isn't an immediate reason why we would do so. So I suppose we keep clear of that. We, we, we keep, clear, we keep a little bit clear of kind of personal journalism in the sense of personal finance, personal uh, sort of lifestyle stuff, and that's very much actually what Intelligent Life does and does, does very well. But we're not, we, we essentially look at what's important. We, we cover such a wide range. You go all the way from, as you said, from politics, science and technology, business, finance, economics. There is so much stuff we can cover probably broader than any other magazine within that, 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 that saying no to Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt is not a difficult decision. What about this balance that the worldwide media is trying to find between online bit and the printed side? Mm. Uh, do you think you have found? Are you still looking for it? How do you try I to separate? I think we're it? beginning to get closer to something. I'm not, you know, I, I think any any editor who is not paranoid about the internet is a fool, basically, because you, you, it changes so quickly. Uh, it's already run through newspapers, as I said, and newspapers have been colossally hit by it, particularly via classified advertising, but just more generally through readership. You know, young people are getting their news from the internet. The thing which I think changes a great deal is the iPad phenomenon. I mean, the iPad, the Kindle, I'm, I'm using the phrase the iPad to cover a wide variety of things, Sony e-reader, all these things. Electronic reading. Now, why are they different? I think they're very important for our industry because we have so far, the magazines tended to be okay in the internet world because what happens is when people go to the internet, they, they lean forward, you're, you're, you're looking, you're looking at something quickly. There's lots of research showing people get quick snippets. They, some, some people go there to discuss and debate things. We do quite a lot of that on our website. But they, they tend to want an immediate response to something and then they jump away. People who read magazines, it's a lean back. You know, you're sitting there, you're lying in bed, you're sitting on a sofa, you're, you're, you're on a train, a plane, you're kind of, you're, you're contemplating. But do you think the, the print version will then tend to disappear, both for no, your I I, I, and your Me personally, others? I don't think the print version will ever disappear, but what is clear to me is that the, 
the, the iPads and their like represent both a much more fundamental threat and opportunity to a news magazine than the, than the internet did because the internet as I said earlier is, is a bit of fantastic you know we've done very we, we've, we, like everyone else we've made mistakes on the internet but we've done you know we, we, it's a profitable business for us we make money we have a large and growing website it, it's great and I want to keep it that way but it is not it has not so far challenged the existence of the print magazine iPads and those things they, they don't they, they challenge the existence of a print print object our aim is to keep on growing print circulation and add these as well and we'll see how we do on the on your editorial line let's say or your, or your political leaning mm -hmm. um, you say that you characterize the economy as, as, as a liberal publication yep. which the term itself is very confusing with different meanings mm -hmm. in, in different countries how do you characterize it essentially on a political level? The center, center right, the liberal open. You know, how do you characterize well, the economist? It's a slightly um, cliched answer, but people, liberals tend to regard themselves as part of the, the radical center. And actually, I take issue with your idea that it's, it's a muddled concept. I don't think it's a muddled concept. Um, well, liberals from, in America are one thing, liberals yeah, in Europe are no, 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 Sorry, sorry you're, you're dead right. I, it's, um, I take issue with the idea that, that liberalism doesn't know what it is. I, I think the old classical liberalism, which is what The Economist has, is, is a remarkably powerful, cohesive ideology, and one actually which, strangely, a lot of people around the world share, the idea of basically, where possible, trying to limit government power, of giving people the chance to go and make money of keeping government out of people's lives and in general championing those sort of values what's quite interesting is a lot of people share that as you point out correctly very few political parties do and actually from our point of view it's it's sort i was thinking about it this the other day it's sort of an advantage we have this idea where you know we in America, sometimes we back the Republicans, sometimes we back the Democrats. You, you, you backed uh, Obama. We backed and, Obama. And you backed the Conservatives here. We backed the Conservatives here. So and actually, know, well, looking from outside, it looks <laughs> a, like a contradiction, but you don't we, see it. Well, liberalism is somewhat practical. You know, you, if, you, if you think a government has run out of ideas, then you will switch. We backed Labour before the Conservatives here, um, but Labour transparently run out of ideas at the last election. Um, the, the, what happens on the whole is that we don't really, we're not identified with a particular political party, and that's incredibly useful, I think. And on the, social issues, you defend legalization of drugs yep. and prostitution, which yes. for and anybody who associates you with a conservative view, with it's, it's a bit of a surprise. No, well, exactly. I think we see ourselves as, go back to the classical liberalism of John Stuart Mill, Adam Smith. You know, these people came from a very clear idea that they wanted to set the market free in, in economics. So we are unreservedly... I suppose pro-capitalism. We're incredibly critical of individual capitalists, but we are we 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 tend to come from that particular side. But I don't see any intellectual contradiction. In fact, I see a massive intellectual cohesion between taking that attitude towards the government in commerce and trade above all else, and also taking it on on issues on private issues. So, if you look at the Economist, where it came from. It came from this tradition of being set up to abolish the Corn Laws, which were the great protectionist thing in, in, in Britain in the 19th century. And when we got rid of those, we started this, the first great age of globalization, which went all the way to the First World War and made people enormously richer. That was one side of it, but the other side was we were against slavery, we were for prison reform, against capital punishment. And those two things go together because they're both, to a large extent, about giving individuals power. Now, I think that is cohesive. Now, to me, the people who are contradictory are the same. If you listen to a Republican senator who sits there and says that he believes in small government, but at the same time wants to send vast amounts of people to prison, I think there's a contradiction in that. I think it's a contradiction between somebody who says he thinks the state shouldn't interfere in your life, and then at the same time immediately says the state should stop people having abortions or, or, or whatever, stop people staying together. Those, I think, are contradictions. I think there's also contradictions from the other side. I think people who sit there and say that they believe in, in, in what sometimes in America what are called liberals, 
they, they have this phrase big government liberals that, that, which is, that is a center left that is a contradiction in terms that that is not liberalism and so I, I think to some extent at the risk of sounding fusty and old-fashioned we have remained liberals throughout this process and other people have switched around but but from a I'm torn between despair and joy. The despair is that this kind of word has got bastardized under so many different versions. And then joy that actually so many people basically agree with it. And there's one caveat I just add very straightforwardly. There's a big difference between liberal and libertarian. Libertarian means that you, you don't take into context any of the pragmatic things. You know, we, are, we believe in small government, but we've also championed, you know, we, we are pro-public health care. Um, in America, most obviously, but, but you know, that's something which we think is a fundamental moral right which people should get. But it's a, it's a, difficult, um, it's a difficult avenue to travel. This, this relationship between the media and, and politicians, uh, you know, there's the old saying that the Journalists and politicians should, journalists should have in relation to politicians the same attitude as the dog has to a lamppost. <laughs> You're a serious and decent magazine would go for such a crude image, but <laughs> how do you see this distance? How do you see the, that relationship? Because sometimes it becomes a bit too cozy. Yeah, it can do. I suppose we, um, I think it's easier to maintain a bit of distance as a, as a, magazine, if I can dare say that, than it is for it to be a daily newspaper because you are not quite so desperate for the daily feed, for the daily need to get things. And also I suppose in our case we focus on ideas. I, I, I think the problem is you, you, you can't be, I think sometimes, and this is being self-critical, I think sometimes you could argue we are a bit too cynical in some ways, is that sometimes you should just applaud um, politicians for getting something done. I think at the moment, to, to be honest, I think you know, Cameron is doing pretty well, for instance. I think you know, maybe perhaps we, we haven't said that enough. Doubtless he would tell me that. But, the, but, but he's, done, you know, he's come in, he's managed to make a coalition work very well. I think parts of uh, turning your own country, I mean, Lula is, if I look at Lula, part of me thinks actually there, there is a sort of, there is a tragedy in Lula in this way, is that it's a source of innate annoyance to me that actually uh, somebody like Chavez can be regarded by many people around the world as a sort of um, liberating left-wing folk hero. And you look at what he has done for his people against what Lula has done for the poor in Brazil, and Lula has done a vast amount more. Um, and, and it's a source of frustration. I would, I would blame Lula a little bit for that, for not I think what Lula should have done is he should have been a lot ruder about Chavez a lot more publicly and repeatedly, but that's, that's his fault. But I think overall, I think the media is not... Occasionally, should, occasionally the media should step back and say, look, this guy has done a, a good job, or this woman has done a good job. And so I think we do tend to be a bit too cynical in that way. When the, when the media does not do a good job and uh, makes mistakes mm. and errors, blames people and uh, affects people's reputation, the question always comes, how do you correct that? Mm. Do you believe that there should be some kind of self-regulation, uh, state laws, or should only the courts be in charge of correcting the media? Very good, very good and very hard question. I, I think on the whole, I go back to the courts. It helps if there is a... You know, Britain is a terrible example of this. It, we have the worst, probably the most poisonously useless libel laws in the world which protect the rich and powerful and yet enable tabloid newspapers to get away with anything. Um, and the reason why is that in Britain the burden of proof in a libel case is entirely on the newspaper. So if you write something about uh, some, somebody which is a well-known sort of um, well-known villain if I can put it that way it, you have to prove that every single thing about that villain is correct. In our case particularly, often you're dealing with people in countries where it's amazingly difficult to get information out, um, and where people, if they put it forward, would, would, would risk great injury. 
Uh, there's all those problems. It, it, everything to do with British libel law is stacked against um, newspapers. And, and yet the odd thing is that the tabloids can maraud, maraud at play partly because it te you tend to have to be reasonably rich and powerful to be able to afford the lawyers, but if you can afford the lawyers in the longer term, you can really, really punish newspapers. And I think a lot of stories in Britain are not covered here, so and other people are coming here for libel tourism. I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a bad thing. So again, Movie stars and celebrities. Yeah, and in general, I would, uh, in general, I, uh, yes, I... Self-regulation is always a slightly dangerous thing. I'd rather go back to the law and the law protects you, but, but, but I think having official... This country has self-regulation in the yes. independent uh, press complaints com uh, commission. Uh, do you think it's kind of an intermediate solution, a compromise between that and state control? I'd, 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 I think I'd rather have it than... I'd certainly rather have it than state control. You know, we, we journalists tend to get on a high horse, especially when uh, we're criticized, and often claim mm. that we defend the interests of the public. Do we really? You know, what, uh, isn't that a bit arrogant on our part? I think, it's, I think it could be self-important. The, 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 the way in which you do it can be self-important. I think one of the, to be nice about Britain, one of, the, one of the good things about Britain, and I could come to regret this, is the existence of um, uh, the, the, the general way in which journalists are viewed, which is as sort of hacks, as um, private eyes have raised, the street of shame, which spends a long time um, ridiculing journalists for their greed and lust and uselessness. And that, I think, is quite a good term. I, I'm always a little bit dangerous going to other countries. You can occasionally get this a bit in America, whereby you are seen as a writer, a, um, a big and self-important figure. I think the press is incredibly important. It, it sits there as a, as, a, as, a, as a monitor. When the press doesn't work, that is a disaster. And when the press has failed, that's right. I think sometimes the, the level to which journalists have become stars or to which they, they, they think they automatically have a role in deciding things, I think that probably is a bad idea. And I quite like, from that perspective, I quite like the, in Britain that idea that journalists are repeatedly kind of um, traduced for being um, as terrible as other people, I think is probably a good thing. And our lights have just gone out. Is that your light? All right. So we journalists are important, but not that important. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you John. so much. Thank you. Se você quiser mais detalhes desta entrevista, veja o blog do Milênio no site da Globo News. Música